today's video, we'll be looking at scary true crime TikToks that will leave you speechless. Is this your chin, mama? Do this and put it on your chin. Oh. This is Samantha Charvi and her daughter, Vianne Mangrio. And sadly, they are no longer here with us today. They lived in Burnley, UK. They had a beautiful, loving mother and daughter relationship. Vianne's father lived in Pakistan. Vianne was only 14, but both her parents were very proud of her because she already had plans to go to Cambridge and study law. Saman had hired a man named Shabazz Khan to do some handiwork mm. around the house, but he did more than just handiwork on the day of October 1st, 2020. The bodies of Saman and Vianne were found when police decided to go to their house for a welfare check. Police launched an investigation investigation and found that the handyman on CCTV was there that day. 52 year old Shabazz Khan was then arrested. He had laced Saman's rose wine with diacepin before oh, ultimately wow. strangling her. A little while after that at 325 p.m. Vianne was coming home from school and when she arrived into the house Khan drugged her and ended her life too. To throw him off as a suspect Khan tried to make it look like the bodies were set on fire by the tea kettle but had trouble doing so so instead he started to write on the wall COVID-19 and my mom is evil to make it look like the two mother and daughter didn't like each other and had a falling out luckily for autopsy it showed that that wasn't the case and that Saman passed away from pressure on her neck while her daughter's body was so badly burnt that they could only say that she died of asphyxiation in Khan's loft they found jewelry worth 27,000 pounds oh, that belonged man. to Saman Khan was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 34 years while his wife who also tried to lie about his whereabouts to the cops was jailed for 30 months always be careful on who you allow in your home i kind of feel like that sentence was a little bit light don't you think is this guy a hero or is he a terrible monster? This guy's name is Steve Sanderson. He's a guy who's currently serving a life in prison sentence for the 1991 murder of his girlfriend. And in 2015, he just happened to get a new cellmate, a man named Theodore Dyer. Now, this guy was sentenced to prison because he did unspeakable things with a nine-year-old girl. And he was trying to hide that fact from the other prisoners. But being his new cellmate, Steven found out right away what Theodore Dyer was in prison for. And while they were alone in their cell together, this guy was trying to explain his situation saying he was framed. Steven told him to be quiet and the next day he would have to find a new cell. Well, the guy kept talking and Steven had just about enough. So Steven punched him in the face a few times, took off his shoelaces and then strangled him and ended his life. The court Yo, gave him one more life crazy. sentence but it wouldn't have mattered because he already had a life sentence. While in court, Steven said about Theodore Dyer, I didn't judge him. The only judge is God. I just set up the appointment. He said, I just set up the appointment. Wow. What is this? Tusk? Oh no, this is some creepy stuff. They didn't turn him into a walrus? Mr. Tusk. How I've missed our merry times together on Ponder Rock. You will not believe Dang. me the killer was. Yo, could you imagine that, right? <clears throat> Someone kidnaps you and they, they turn you into that, right? And you ain't got no choice but to live like that. You know, he's probably not going to knock you off. He's not going to end it right there for you. He's going to make you suffer. So you got to live the rest of your life just like that. And you have no choice. That would be crazy. I kind of want to see that movie now. ...was in this child murder case. It was August in 1993 in New York when four-year-old Derek Roby was making his way to summer camp. He only lived one block away and his mum claims that this was the first time she'd ever let him walk anywhere on his own. Tragically, that afternoon, Derek's remains were found. He was discovered in the nearby woods about halfway between his house and his intended destination. He'd been lured from the pavement, strangled and beaten with rocks. Whoa. Disturbingly, he'd been SA'd with a stick. It's also worth noting that when he was found, he had Kool-Aid poured all over his body. Bizarrely, four days Late. later, 13-year-old Eric Smith offered to help police with the case. When police questioned him, he initially claimed to not have seen Derek that day, but he then did keep changing his story. Now, when Eric's dad attended the police station to see what was going on, he offered Eric some Kool-Aid. Eric reacted very bizarrely to this and threw the Kool-Aid on the floor. At this point, police were very suspicious of Eric, and they also found out from neighbors that he'd been asking very strange questions. These were questions all about DNA evidence and also what would happen if they found that a child had killed Derek. Shortly after, Eric did confess to the killing. He claimed that it was because of his anger about being bullied by other kids. At the age of 13, he was convicted of second degree murder. 
This is a more recent picture of Eric and he was actually released from prison in February of this year. The Teletubbies conspiracy theory claims that the show was inspired by events in a Bulgarian mental facility called La La Land. So they're saying Teletubbies is real? Psychotic children were purportedly isolated in dark rooms and apparently four children who died on the same day inspired the characters in Teletubbies. No way. La La's facial disfigurement and five years of isolation inspired La La. Tuate, a deaf, facially deformed child, was tied to the fence outdoors in Frostbitten, inspiring Tinky Winky. Donka, starving and unwell, inspired Dipsy by lying in his vomit for days. These Teletubbies Ultimately, are creepy, man. These pictures Paulina are wild. fell into a fire and was roasted alive, inspiring Poe. So why are they called the Teletubbies? The children's main source of comfort were the television oh, sets in their room. Teletubbies, and when they television. got word that the mental institution mm. was getting rid of them, the children concocted a plan to hide the TVs. The children would rip out their insides to hide the miniature TV sets that were too big to swallow, only to be found dead by the returning caregivers the next morning. I don't know how true that is, but that's crazy. This is the case of 16-year-old Susana Morales and how a police officer has been accused of murdering her. On Tuesday, July 22, 2022, 16-year-old Susana Morales went to go visit a friend that lived nearby. This friend lived in the Sterling Glen Apartments, which was near Susana's home on Santa Ana Drive. Susana would normally walk to this friend's house, so this was a route that she had taken many times. She left her home at around 6 p.m. and was at her friend's house for a couple of hours. At around 9.40 p.m., Susana texted her mother Maria and told her that she was on her way home. Again, this should have taken her a very short amount of time since they lived so close it should have taken her about 10 minutes mm -hmm. however when 10 minutes went by susana was still not home maria began texting and calling susana to see if everything was okay but she never got a response back the family continued to try and get in contact with susana but at about 9 a.m the following morning on july 27th the morales family called the police department and reported susana as missing However, the police department told the family that they didn't believe Susana was missing or that she was in any type of danger. In fact, they told the family that she was most likely a runaway. They also told wow. them that they needed to wait 48 hours before officially reporting her as missing. Yo, pause. How many cases do you think are just like this, right? Kind of like a cover-up, you know what I mean? Like, wow, that's crazy. They're talking about you gotta wait 48 hours. Like, who's gonna wait 48 hours when a child goes missing? I'm not. It's like stories like these make you just want to go live in a box with your loved ones and never do anything, you know, because people are crazy and they do stupid, crazy stuff. Now, the family knew that Susana would not voluntarily leave. Things were great at home. She had a loving family. She had loving sisters, loving parents, a boyfriend, and it just wasn't like her to go completely MIA. So the family took the investigation into their own hands and they started going around the community asking if anyone had seen Susana the night that she disappeared. And someone did. One of their neighbors caught security camera of Susana walking home. Now this neighbor's house was very close to the Morales house. It was literally just a one minute walk. You can see Susana wearing a yellow tank top, light blue jeans, and white Crocs. She was walking by herself on the route that she would normally take to go back home. However, somewhere between her neighbor's house, which was just a minute away, and her house, something happened. Family showed this footage to the police because it clearly shows that Susana was not running away. She had her phone on her hand and she was literally walking home. So police looked at this footage and they decided to look at her phone records to see if it could ping a location. Phone records show that between 10.07 and 10.21 p.m., Susana was walking in the direction of her house on Singleton Road. Then between 10.21 p.m. and 10.26 p.m., her phone indicated that she was in the area of Oak Lock Trace and Steve Reynolds Boulevard. After that, her phone either died or was turned off. After discovering this information, there really wasn't any serious movement in Susana's case. It literally took police a month to put out a statement letting people know that Susana was missing, but at this time, they still considered her a runaway. However, that would all change on February 6, 2023. This is when the remains of 16-year-old Susana Morales were discovered along Highway 316 between Drowning Creek and Barrow County. And next to Susana Susana's remains, police found a when police checked the serial number, it came back as belonging to 22-year-old Miles Bryant. And it turns out that Miles was actually a oh, police wow. officer. Okay, more in part two. Wow. See, it'd be your own people. The ones Don't supposed be fooled to by the smile. This guy is one of the biggest dickheads to ever live on this planet. This asshole's name is Nikolai Shoshesku. Oh, he don't like this guy. He already didn't call him two names. So, 
He don't like this guy. Let's see how many more he calls him. He was the dictator of Romania from 1964 to 1989. And because of this prick's horrible economic policies, his country was drowning in debts. In Ceausescu's mind, the best way to combat this was to tell his own citizens to make more babies. In his mind, more babies meant more people in the workforce. Romanian citizens listened to this guy and before long, they had more babies than they knew what to do with. Parents couldn't take care of so many children, so orphanages ended up getting really overcrowded. In some orphanages, these kids were literally not even being fed because this useless sack of shit refused to allocate enough funds towards these orphanages. This is only one of the many atrocities this fucker committed. So it's no surprise that in 1989, him and his wife were both executed by firing squad by Romanian citizens for crimes uh -huh. against humanity. Okay, this appears to be one of the weirdest true crime stories in history. I see, because there's a and lot of them. it's one that totally flew under the radar, at least in the United States, because of when it happened and where it happened. Back in early 2017, two separate women in two separate countries were both approached by men saying they wanted to film a series of prank videos for YouTube. One was from Vietnam, one was from Indonesia. They were paid a small amount of money for this, although it wasn't a small amount of money to them. The prank was that they would run up to strangers in public places and smear some sort of lotion or baby oil or something on their faces and then apologize and run away or kiss them on the cheek and run away and that was the prank. And they did this over and over and over again, getting specific direction from the guys who hmm. hired them on how to dress, on exactly where to smear the cream, that kind of thing. They did it, they got paid, everything seemed fine, they assumed these videos were going up somewhere. In February of 2017, each of the women were told, hey, we're going to bring in a partner. The two of you are going to work together on this one. It's at Kuala Lumpur Airport in Malaysia. They were told exactly how to dress. One of them was told to wear a white t-shirt with the letters LOL on it. You know, like maybe that was branding for the prank channel or something. Hmm. They were shown the target. They ran up. They smeared the stuff on his face. And then he died. This time, the baby oil had been replaced by the deadly nerve agent VX. Oh, wow. The prank victim was Kim Jong-nam, the half-brother of Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Oh, snap. The two women were apparently unknowingly carrying out an assassination on behalf of the regime. They didn't even know what See, was going Kim on. See, Kim Jong-nam had been working with the CIA, apparently, and had been exiled from North Korea since 2003. They had apparently tried to take him out multiple times and finally succeeded by convincing two young women they were acting in a prank YouTube video. That's crazy. They went that far. I could see it, though. I could definitely believe it. Years ago, the nation was shocked and overjoyed to hear that two missing children had been found alive. Let's read this. It says, on December 4th, 1972, Stephen Stainer was walking from school when he was abducted by Kenneth Parnell. In 72, y'all. Stainer proceeded to live as Parnell's son for seven years. During this time, Parnell attempted to use Stephen in other adoptions, but Stephen was uncooperative. But on February 13th, 1980, Parnell abducted another young boy, five-year-old Timothy White. For weeks, Timothy cried, and hearing these cries, Stephen decided to do something about it. On the night of March 1st, 1980, Stephen took Timothy and escaped Parnell's house, making their way to a local police station. Stephen was finally reunited with his family the next day. He wasn't the boy they remembered, but a teenager now. He, was he found it difficult to adjust and mostly kept his experiences to himself. Kenneth Parnell was sentenced to seven years in prison, but was released due to good behavior only after serving five. But in 2005, he was sentenced to life in prison after attempting another abduction. In 1989, Stephen Stainer was unalived when he was struck by a car riding his motorcycle. Oh, that's unfortunate. In a disturbing twist in August 2002, Stephen's older brother, Kerry Stainer, was convicted of unaliving three people. He currently is on death row at California's San Quentin State Prison. Yo. That family has some These stuff are the going most on. the haunted places in Pakistan, starting at number four. And no one is willing to restore the site. But anyone who dares to go near the fort returns with fear and horror. It is said that the last queen that resided in the fort died there 
and it has since hmm. been haunted. Number two, I believe Mohata in haunted palace places in Karachi. This palace is ranked as the most haunted historical landmark in Pakistan. Today, this palace serves as a museum. The guards and the workers in this palace have experienced dreadful activities. They would see artifacts moving. The staff always what? warn visitors not to come alone if they want to avoid an unwanted encounter. And finally, hmm. number one, cars as their cars. It's safe to say that Karsas Road isn't the most welcoming place in Pakistan. You tell me, what country should I do next? I don't know, but I don't want to have any of those encounters with any of the This is a case of, of four University cool. of Idaho students and how they were murdered in the middle of the night. Five students lived in this house on King Road in Moscow, Idaho. On the first floor, we have roommate BF. On the second floor, we have roommate DM and 20-year-old Zana Kernodal. Lastly, on the third floor, we have 21-year-olds Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonsalves. On the night of Saturday, November 12, 2022, Maddie and Kaylee arrived to a bar called The Corner Club at around 10 p.m. They were there for a couple of hours, and then at around 1.40 in the morning, the two girls headed over to a local food truck to get some food. After this, they made their way back home and arrived at around 1.56 in the morning. Later that night, Kaylee posted this photo on Instagram with the roommates plus Zana's boyfriend, Ethan Chapin, and she captioned it, One lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day. Now, as for Ethan and Zana's routine that night, they had gone to a house party nearby and had gotten back to the house at around 1.46 in the morning. Now, even though Ethan didn't live at the house, he decided to spend the night there with his girlfriend. So by 2 o'clock in the morning, all of the roommates plus Ethan were already at the house, either mm. asleep or getting ready for bed. However, we do know that Xana remained awake. It was one guy with all of these girls. Like, that's a red flag right there. Not gonna lie. For some time, because at around 4 o'clock in the morning, she ordered a DoorDash order to be delivered to the house. Around that same time, roommate DM was woken up by the sound of what she thought was Kaylee playing with her dog Murphy up on the third floor. A short time later, she heard who she thought was Kaylee say something to the effect of, there's someone here. However, this also could have been Xana because her phone records show that she was on TikTok at around 4.12 in the morning. So after hearing someone say, there's someone here, roommate DM looked outside her bedroom door, but she didn't see anything. Then, DM opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Xana's bedroom. She also heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Finally, DM opened her door a third time when she heard crying, and this time, she saw something. She saw someone dressed in all black wearing a mask that covered their nose and their mouth walking towards her. He was a male, 5'10 or taller, not really muscular but athletically built and had bushy eyebrows. This man just walked past DM as she stood frozen in place and headed over towards the back sliding glass door. After seeing this male, she quickly locked herself back inside her room. Later that morning at around 11.58 in the morning, either roommate BF or roommate DM called 911 and requested help for an unconscious person. And when police arrived to the scene, they found the deceased bodies of Xana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves. All four of them had been stabbed and police believe that the murders happened somewhere between between 4 o'clock in the morning and 4.25 in the morning. During the investigation, police did find a shoe print outside of DM's bedroom, and they also recovered a tan leather knife sheet that was lying on the bed next to Maddie's right side. Through surveillance footage, police also discovered that a white sedan had passed by the house numerous times the night of the murders. Okay, more in part two. Yo, that is crazy. I did not expect that to go down, I ain't gonna lie. I was thinking like, uh, the guy went crazy and you know, he was the one that did all this stuff, but apparently there was another person in there. And what kind of threw me off was when they said roommate DM seen a guy in all black coming towards her room. So she just locks her door, doesn't say anything. And they say later on that day, someone decides to call 911 or later on in the morning. So that was a little bit confusing. I don't know if room DM, like roommate DM told them to call 911 or what was going on. But man, you got to be careful out here for real. Did you guys know that the movie The Hills Have Eyes is actually based on a true story and the actual story is just as disturbing if not more? So this Hey yo, The Hills Have Eyes. Yo, I, I remember that movie. That movie was creepy. I'm talking about, oh my God. Trying to watch that as a child. <laughs> Me and my brother, no way. It takes us to a place called East Lothian in Scotland and that's where we meet Sonny Bean. Sonny came from a very poor family and his father was a ditch digger and a hedge trimmer. 
So naturally, his father expected his son to follow in his footsteps. However, Sonny ended up meeting a woman called Agnes Black, and a lot of people suspected her of being a witch, if not evil. Some people even claimed that she ate human flesh. Hmm. So knowing that their relationship would never be approved, they decided to run away together. However, they went for a very alternative lifestyle. They were said to have started living in this cave here, and it's located on the Galloway coast in Scotland. And because this story took place in the 1600s, the couple were able to get away with a lot. Together, they ended up having eight sons and six daughters, and all of those kids ended up producing 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters. That's a big family tree. So yes, basically, they were all breeding with each other. Now, because they were living in a very remote area, they basically had no human contact. Whenever they would see a human passing by the coast, they would attack them. These are some of the scariest last words ever said by serial killers. And I found all these on Reddit. Number one is Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most notorious serial killers of all time and he ate a lot of people. And his last words were, I don't care if I live or if I die, so go ahead and kill me. Number two is Peter Curtin, aka the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Peter was on death row for killing over 60 people and drinking some of their blood. And his last words were, Vampire? tell me, after my head's been chopped off, would I be able to hear the blood gushing out of my head? Number three, John Avalos Alba. John was on death row for fatally shooting his wife while he was on probation. And his last words were, okay, warden, let's do it. I love y'all. I can taste it already. I'm starting to go. Next up, we have Jimmy Glass. Jimmy was on death row after he escaped prison and went on to kill two people. And his last words were, I'd rather be fishing. And finally, we have Eileen Wuamos. Eileen was on death row for killing seven men between 1989 and 1990. And her last words were, I'd like to say I'll be sailing with The Rock, and I'll be back on Independence Day with Jesus, June 6th, just like the movie, Big Mothership and all. I'll be back. Hearing all of those was haunting, but that's why. Yeah, which one was the, uh, the craziest one to y'all? I think the last just one Just imagine capturing this on your ring camera. It was 2018 and just outside of her condo in Phoenix, Yo. Arizona when Jessica Catania got an alert on her phone and saw this. According to her eventual statement, she immediately realizes she's in danger. She locks her bedroom door, she starts dialing 911, but that's when she heard it. So whoever this man was, he then pries open the living room window and pops out the screen. He's in the house. But this woman, Jessica, she's like incredibly resourceful in a stressful situation. She immediately grabbed a hammer, any weapon that she could find from her closet, Ooh, and she hides in the bathroom. But while she's waiting in there, she's got the door locked, but it would only be about three minutes before she eventually hears police inside her condo. But the problem is, they never found the man. To this day, she has no idea who this man was or why he broke into her. Do look condo. creepy. In the investigation police would eventually nickname him Smiles. Smiles looks creepy. She grabbed that hammer. We need to talk about Feeling. this photo because Josh Maddox was found inside this chimney with his knees bent over his head and he had been there for seven years. So what happened seven to him years? and how did he end up stuck inside a chimney for that long? Allegedly, Josh went out on a walk one day and completely what? disappeared until one day a builder from Colorado Springs wanted to demolish his old abandoned cabin. And that's when Josh was found curled up and mummified inside the chimney. But the strange thing is, even though his body was found with with its knees bent over his head, there were no injuries or broken bones. The coroner who performed Josh's autopsy believes he crawled up the chimney himself, and he curled up in that position to protect himself from something. But this case gets even more bizarre from here. Not only was Josh found in such an unnatural position, but he was found only wearing a thermal suit. The rest of his clothes were in the cabin neatly folded. So why would he fold up his clothes and then crawl up the chimney? The chimney also had a heavy steel mesh grate built into it, so it would have been impossible for anyone to slide back down the chimney. Many people disagree, but this terrible incident was eventually ruled as an accident, even though we'll never truly know what Josh wanted to protect himself from by crawling up the chimney. Follow for more. This woman unalived her neighbor all that was because crazy. he did not accept her Christmas gift. Hi, my name is Ethan, and warning, this is a dark case. To really get into the story, 37-year-old Melissa Young was arrested for the brutal killing of her next-door neighbor, Alan Williamson, on Christmas Day of 2013. In court, she claimed that mental health issues was the reason behind her attack. However, she told investigators a different story. Her motive was due to Alan not accepting her Christmas gift. What was in the gift was a pair of unisex trainers and a copy of the Sun 
Sun newspaper's 2014 calendar. Melissa claimed that he would not accept the gift even after she basically begged him, and that's what made her want to kill him. She pleaded guilty to homicide in 2014 and received a 20-year sentence. While in jail, she has also assaulted two female police officers. And let this just be a note to always accept a gift. Straight up. If someone tries to give you something, accept A man it. in India became infected with a deadly plant fungus in the world's first case of human infection. The 61-year-old man went to the hospital with complaints of recurring cough, hoarseness of voice, difficulty swallowing, a sore throat, and fatigue that had been lasting about three months. The man who was not named is a mushroom hunter and had no underlying health conditions that would put him at risk. It is completely unclear when he contracted the infection since he waited a while to go to the hospital. Doctors performed an x-ray and CT scan on the man. The x-ray on his chest came back normal, but the CT scan results showed a paratracheal abscess on his neck. That's what this is right here. Uh, paratracheal abscess paratracheal can block abscess. airways and lead to life-threatening infections, which can be deadly if not caught and treated quickly. The pus was completely drained from the abscess and was sent to the World Health Organization in northern India for testing, and the man was given two antifungal medications to take for the next two months. Doctors diagnosed the man with this, which I cannot pronounce, and it is a plant fungus that causes silver leaf disease in plants. Silver leaf infects the wood and leaves of some trees, causing them to turn a silvery gray color and is spread by airborne spores. Researchers shared that until this case, there has been no evidence that humans hmm. could be infected by this particular fungus. Of all the millions of fungi out there, currently just a few hundred can affect humans and animals as well as plants. One researcher writes, quote, Over the past several decades, multiple new pathogenic fungi have emerged. The worsening of global warming and other civilization activities opens Pandora's box for newer fungal diseases. Rising temperatures can expedite the number of mutations that occur in fungi, increasing drug resistance and adapting them to survive in humans. Man, it better not be no crazy infections My coming out here just because of the weather. Still calling me daddy. She wasn't old enough to even get to the stage to call me dad. It's a slap in the face to all of you, Valdi, mm. especially the ones that lost a loved one. The AR-15 you get if you donate $5,000 to the NRA. The one at the bottom killed 19 kids and two teachers. The CEO of a gun manufacturing company, Christopher Killoy, defended this as an inanimate object. An inanimate object that shot 100 rounds in two and a half minutes, killing my little cousin, Annabelle Rodriguez, 10 years old. Children were murdered. Murdered and taken from them. My granddaughter was murdered. All we were asking for is some compassion and some respect. This is a deliberate disrespect for the grief of these families and an attempt to shut them up, saying that their sorrow should not get in the way of our fun. This isn't something that should even be discussed. The life of a child is way more important than any NRA fundraising event. Hey, y'all, what if I told y'all that the... I don't think it's because of the guns. I think it's because of the people, you know, like there's crazy people out in this world and they be doing some crazy stuff. And, you know, you put a dangerous object in the hands of a crazy person. There's no telling what they're going to do with it. Classic horror movie Jeepers Creepers. Yo, and Jeepers Creepers, man, look, that that messed my childhood up. I'm not even going to lie. That movie is crazy. Was inspired by a real life killer. And to notice, if y'all remember wild. this opening scene in the movie, this is quite similar yep. to today's true crime story. On April 15, 1990, a couple named Ray and Marie Thornton were out for a drive in Coldwater, Michigan. All of a sudden, a van passes them high speed. This kind of surprised the couple, but they just kind of went on about their business. As the couple continued their drive, Marie notices the same van that passed them earlier. She saw a man disposing a large white sheet covered in blood in a large tank by this abandoned schoolhouse. Mm. Seconds later, that same man she saw followed the couple for several miles. He saw the couple when he disposed the bloody white sheet and decided to go after them. Luckily, the couple was able to lose him. Let me tell you about Ray and Marie. These two were so bold that they decided to go back and find the man so they can write down his license plate. They went back and they saw the man changing license plates on the side of the road, and Marie also saw that there was blood on the interior of the passenger side door. So they got the license plate information and went back to the abandoned schoolhouse, and that's when they discovered the bloody white sheet, and they called 911. 
What Ray and Marie didn't know that day was that 46-year-old Dennis Pugh murdered his wife, 48-year-old Marilyn. Oh, no. Dennis and Marilyn were married for 18 years, and Marilyn was just not happy in the relationship, and she wanted a divorce. Dennis was mad about the divorce, plus the joint custody between their three children. That day, Dennis and Marilyn got into a heated argument, and Dennis pushed Marilyn down the stairs in front of their children. Dennis told them that he was going to take their mom to the hospital, and that was the last time that they saw their mom. The next day, Marilyn's body was found alongside a road, and she had a bullet wound in her head. Ooh. There, the manhunt for Dennis the Pew began. Dennis created a new identity, moved to Louisiana, and even had a girlfriend. Almost a year after the murder, Dennis was seen, and he led the police on a 15-mile chase from Louisiana to Mississippi. After refusing to pull over, the police created a roadblock and shot his tires. When Dennis stopped the car, he pulled out a 357 Magnum handgun and shot himself. Yes, y'all, he took the coward way out. You'll be surprised how many horror movies out there that are inspired by real life killers. All right, y'all, I'll be back to do more true crime videos for you guys. Jeepers and Jeepers Creepers is one of the scariest movies I've ever seen as a kid. I ain't gonna lie. Scariest Facts You Didn't Know, Part 1. The Colombian serial killer Pedro Alonso Lopez, who is known as the Monster of Andes, raped and murdered over 300 girls from Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia. However, after he was caught and imprisoned for 18 years, he was put in a psychiatric hospital. There, he was reviewed, declared to be sane, and was set free in spite of his blatant avowal that he was fully intense. Oh my god. Since he was released in 1998, nobody knows where he is or what he's doing. He is supposed to be 74 years old at present, and he is known for being the most prolific killer ever. And he's out here, guys. Watch out for him. Horrifying things that serial killers did. I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, uric acid in the no One of those failed experiments to create a living zombie was conducted on this 14-year-old boy. Jeffrey had drilled a hole in his head and poured in acid, a crude attempt at lobotomy that none of his victims survived. You know, the killing wasn't, wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control uh, to do this as I wanted. It's not easy to say that, but that's, that's what the motive was. Yeah, why do we have such a big fascination with serial killers? I don't know why. Why on earth See, did you have hurt those people? Serial. Why did you kill those people? Uh, no comments. No comments. I, I cannot answer it at this time. And that's why you killed them. Right. Right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. Nonetheless, yes. you killed seven men. Yes, you and did. And I'm asking you, what got you to kill the seven and men? And I'm telling you because the cops let me keep killing them, Nick. Don't you not, get it? Not every hey, I think she was telling the truth. What is this? I would have been scared. Scary facts. Did you know if you smell smoke and there is nothing burning, that could mean you could be surrounded by spirits. Yo, that's that's crazy because, right? Man, look, my mom, she does this all the time. Like, we'll just be chilling in the living room. She'll be like, y'all smell some, somebody smoking? Y'all smell smoke? Right, and be like, nah, ain't no smoking here. Nobody's smoking. You know, and she'll do it quite often. I gotta tell her about this one now. We might got some spirits around us. Now, if you've followed me for any amount of time, you'll know that I've already spoken about Elsa Gate once before. If you have no clue what Elsa Gate is, let me give you a brief rundown. Elsa Gate refers to a internet phenomenon which happened maybe five, six, four years ago now on YouTube Kids. And what it would consist of is these channels would upload videos with Elsa, mostly Elsa and Spider-Man, and have really inappropriate thumbnails. 
Um, here is a very brief example behind me. And these right, thumbnails were that this? graphic and disgusting. And the videos would be very unsettling as well for like children audience. And due to this, YouTube did actually start taking down all of these videos. And these videos raked in millions of views from little children. So the people behind them were, were making bank. But oh my goodness, it does not stop there. In fact, not has it stopped, it's gotten worse. So after YouTube stepped in, Elsagate did die down. But people have worked their way around it. It's back, and it's worse, and it's with lots of different characters. Now some of the thumbnails yeah. I'm about to show I've had to blur, or, or like scribble out, because they are that graphic. Here is just one example. Example number two. Oh, no. Example number three. And you gotta watch what your kids watch. Four. Now, I just want you to keep in For mind real. that these are targeted to children and on the children's version of YouTube. I don't know if, about you, but I find this genuinely sickening. Like, this is so gross. And I would love to know what actually possesses people to make videos like this and aim them at children. Like, I understand children think, haha, poo, funny, but there's a line. Like, there's, there's a line. Not only that, yeah. some of these... Look at this. Thumbnails and videos are ads. So I don't know how ads work on YouTube, but I'm guessing YouTube, you have to pay YouTube for it to be advertised and they have to monetize that and make sure the video's appropriate to be monetized. I could be completely wrong. Again, with other famous characters, yeah. as I said, this has come back. Kids the videos be talking are about still all that stuff pretty too. much available Huggy all over the internet. All you have to do is Rainbow search friends. in a child's character and scroll for a little while and trust me you'll come across something but this time nothing seems to be happening about it and i don't think anything will and the reason for this is i think it's too too hard to monitor for all we know these thumbnails could just be clickbait but like i said just gross really really gross what's your thoughts on that man why are they always targeting young August 12, 1967 19 year old julie helgeson and her friend 18 year old roy ducat set up their sleeping bags under the stars so no tent about 500 meters away from the granite park chalet in glacier national park which is in montana hmm. the two were going to get to watch this crazy lightning storm that was going on just this amazing show before they would eventually fall asleep Eventually, they did fall asleep, only to be awakened a few hours later at 12.30 a.m. by this horrible smell. And very quickly, Julie, to her horror, discovers where this smell is coming from. There's an adult grizzly bear just looming over the two of them in the darkness. Mm, and she whispers mm -hmm. over at Roy, and she says, play dead. But as soon as she says this, the bear just rips Roy out of his sleeping bag. It jumps on Roy's back and it begins biting his shoulder before it moves down and begins biting his legs. And then it's biting him on the back. Now, Roy amazingly is able to stay silent, stay limp. He plays dead. And when the bear thinks that it's killed Roy, it turns to Julie. And now Roy can hear the sound of this bear biting into Julie through her sleeping bag. And Julie immediately begins screaming for somebody to come help them. At this point, the bear picks her up and begins dragging her downhill away from the chalet towards the woods. Roy, he gets up and he kind of runs, hobbles to this camper that's not too awfully far away. And he's pounding on the door. A man opens up the camper door and sees him all bloodied. The man gives him some medical aid and they call for help. They call rangers. A helicopter comes in, gets Roy, flies him to a hospital. And, you know, he makes it just fine. And then this park ranger is gathering a group of people to go look for Julie in the darkness. But it takes them two hours to gather enough people where they feel safe. Eventually, they get about a dozen people, including a doctor, and they go down the hill in search of two her. Two hours. They come across a blood trail, and about 100 yards away from where she was initially attacked, in the woods, they come across Julie. And amazingly, she's alive. What? Right I was not expecting that. Nod down to the bone. She has puncture wounds in her throat. And in her chest, in her lungs, she has bite marks all over her legs, which have since stopped bleeding, which is not a good sign. So they scoop her up, they bring her back to the chalet, they get her there at about 3.45 a.m., where two doctors who are staying at the chalet begin to work on her. But very quickly, they realize she's lost too much blood, and they just don't have what they need to save her. There's no way that they're going to save her life. So they do the only thing that they can think to do, which is give her an injection of painkillers to ease her passing. And then a priest um, held her hand and gave her her last rites 
until he felt her go limp and she was pronounced dead at 4.12 a.m. What nobody knew was just miles away, a different bear attacked a different girl and it was much worse. What are the coincidences, man? These bears ain't nothing to play with. Don't catch me in no forests with no bears doing no type of camping. Terrifying last words people said right before passing away. Hmm. An ER physician says he's heard many last words before, but this one was the most terrifying. There was a man who was taking his last breath as he succumbed to renal failure. And right before he passed away, he said, I see a bright light, horses, no eyes. Then he started screaming, no, no, no. And as he yelled, he suddenly woke up, looked up towards the ceiling, and with his last breath said, I understand. Then right after, he passed away. According to this ER physician, this could be provoked by certain neurotransmitters during organ failure. But sometimes he still thinks that maybe that patient saw more than we're led to believe. Let me know if I should make a part two and follow for more. This is why I would never hire a stranger for a kid's birthday party. Right, what and if the, the photo's is not that? bad enough, the mystery behind it is so much worse. And a reminder before I dive in that if you like all things spooky and true crime, check out my podcast. There's a link to it in my profile. So in the 1940s, the McLaren family in Houston, Texas was having a birthday party for their daughter, Rose. They hired a clown for the party, but an hour before the party started, they get a call from the company saying that the clown they hired was no longer available. They were going to send someone else in his place. And the parents were like, okay, fine, whatever. But then this man shows up to the party and the kids are all terrified of him. No one really wants to take photos. The man stayed at Yo, like, if that shows up to your kid's birthday party, what are you gonna do? I'm gonna tell dude, turn around, bro. Like, what's up with your outfit? Like, nah, you can't be here right now. Like, you finna scare my kids. At the party for about 20 minutes and then just disappeared. But get this. After he left, the clown that they hired showed up to the party and he apologized for being late. And the mother is like, what are you doing here? You canceled on us. And the clown's like, no, I didn't. And it was at that moment that one of the parents noticed that this little boy pictured here was missing. The little boy was never found, and the identity of this man remains a mystery even today. Wow, so they never found the little boy? That's messed up. Creepy unsolved mysteries that might creep you out. Number 10, the net Cayadito. Oh, In the right. early hours of April 6, 1986, nine-year-old Antoinette was abducted by two men in a brown van from her home. The following year after the disappearance, Gallup, New Mexico police received the following eerie, frantic phone call. Gallup, Department. Hello. I'm, I'm Antoinette Okay, whereabouts in Albuquerque? Hello? Four years later, in Carson, New Mexico, a waitress at a restaurant noticed a couple and a teenage girl who matched the description of Antoinette. After the girl and the couple left, the waitress found the following note under the teenage girl's plate. Antoinette has been missing for 35 years. Yo, this girl called the police, said where she was at, left a note and everything, and they still haven't found her? What's going on with that? That's just some messed up, like, wow. I would hate that, like, imagine that. Somebody you know goes missing. They call you, they get to the phone, they're able to call the police, but nothing happens. They leave a note, but nothing happens. Like, man. This Polish woman is claiming to be the missing Madeline McCann, but did you know there's age progression photos done of Madeline that could help us know what she would look like today? In 2007, Madeline was taken from her family's bedroom while they were on vacation in Portugal, and immediately the parents came under fire because they did leave the kids asleep in the apartment by themselves while they went to dinner with friends. This is the official age progress photo of Madeline to age 9, and this is the woman who's now claiming that she is Madeline. And this woman does have some of Madeline's signature features. Here you can see a black oh. speck that looks like a pupil in Madeline's eye, which is something they both share. She's also claiming that she has a lot of missing memories from childhood, but the eye spec does seem to be her most convincing argument. But German prosecutors actually believe that Madeline is no longer alive. And two people believe they saw this man carrying a small girl towards the beach around the time that Madeline's parents first noticed that she was missing. But that being said, it's not completely impossible that she would be alive today. Do y'all think that's her or not? I mean, it kind of looks like Let's her. talk about this picture. It centers around Mr. and Mrs. Dubois. They were some of the town of Hack and Show's favorite neighbors, but they had a dark side to them. But first, we're gonna enjoy some pizza. 
is like my favorite pizza. It's from Marcos Pizza. Like Marcos? Reminds me of Jersey because I'm from Jersey. We don't even have a Marcos in town no more. We used to have family video and Marcos was connected to the family video, but that's all closed down. You see, they were kind to everyone. Even invited people who just moved into town for dinners. They would also have the best decorations for holidays as well. Their house would always win the contest for best decorated in the town. People just loved their Christmas lights and their Halloween decorations. In the beginning of October 1876, they started throwing parties for the kids. All the kids from around the town would come, even from outside the town. It was fun. They played games, they ate candy, and everyone just had a good time. But out of the 20 kids that came over that night, about four went missing. And after about three weeks of searching, the case went slow and they gave up. Halloween finally came around and the contest for the best decorations, of course, went to the Dubois. That night while trick-or-treating, one of the boys in town named Sam went up to one of the decorations. When he grabbed the mask off, he realized it was one of the children who went missing. The child was stuffed and put on display in front of the yard as a decoration. The Dubois, who saw this and not wanting to get caught, grabbed the little kid inside adding him to their collection. No one suspected a thing because the Dubois were so kind and nice to everyone. It wasn't until years later on their deathbed that they admitted at throwing parties every year to steal a child or three and told police that they could find all the missing three. children in their basement. The reason they did it was because they needed decorations realistic enough so they could always win those contests. Why is Creepy everyone people talking out here, about yo. this woman? It's this woman, 59-year-old Debbie Collier, who was a mother and office manager who was found charred alive in the northeast of Georgia. But while I'm sitting here and I'm, you know, researching this case, it's even stranger than I thought it was. Something is deeply off with this story. So here's what we know. September 10th, she is reported missing, and the following day, her van is found, but she's not inside. So the daughter comes forward. I ain't gonna lie, his volume kind of sucks right now. I feel like he's like using his hand as a microphone but got the the microphone off to the side i really can't even hear you when she says that you know her mom doesn't have any history of mental illness she wouldn't be trying to hurt herself so what like happened here well later that day after the van was found they go deeper into the woods where debbie is found on a tarp described as burned alive but this was a tarp she bought herself at the dollar tree like shortly before she was found stranger than that her daughter comes forward and says before she was found her mom venmoed her twenty three hundred eighty five dollars along with this cryptic message Does that not seem like an oddly specific amount though most Jim. terrifying demonic activity ever caught on camera bobby is that you bobby i get Damn, it with the horns in front of the church i get it man just gonna stare at each other for like what? You got me. I don't know what the fuck their problem is. I'm gonna keep doing this shit. I'm just gonna stare at him then. Fuck okay, it, right? Yeah, he's spooked. I'm just gonna stare at him. Man. I'm gonna stare at him. I'm gonna stare at him. What the fuck, man? Come on, dude. What y'all doing in this situation? I'm just like him. I'm running to the crib. Go. Go, 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 go. Just go to your room. It's fine. You got the blinds open at night. What's up with that? Let's see the fucking thing. All right. Yeah. I know, did you? You got me. Jim, you got me. You got me, man. You got me. Okay, it's good. I'd have been scared to open the door. And just stay in your room. You can keep opening. The oldest traceable body on Mount Everest is considered to be that of George Mallory, an English mountaineer who was part of the first British expeditions up the mountain in the early 1920s. He and his hiking partner, Andrew Irvine, were last seen about 800 feet from the summit before disappearing. In 1999, an expedition up the mountain sought to find Mallory, and they did, well preserved too. Injuries sustained on his body and circumstantial evidence give some idea as to what happened to him, namely that he slipped, fell and conked himself in the forehead with his own ice axe. Ugh. We still don't know if Mallory and Irvine reached the summit before their fatal accident, but some in the field believe that Mallory did. They also think he left a photo of his wife at the summit, 
because it wasn't on his body when it was found. And he always carried it. We don't know much about Irvine because his body is still unlocated. And on an eerie note, Mallory and Irvine had a camera with them to record the historic event, which if ever found, would likely give us some fascinating insight into their journey. So people who climb these mountains, like, I'm cool on the suicide, I'm good. Erica's family told her they were going on vacation in Lake Tahoe, when in reality, they were dropping her off at a troubled teen wilderness program that she would not survive. Erica Harvey was just 15 years old when she was dropped off at the Catherine Freer Wilderness Program. The program promised Erica's family that they could get her off drugs, but the staff were not trained very well. The first day that she was there, the kids all went on a really long hike and Erica started showing symptoms of dehydration. Erica was also on antipsychotic medication, which was something the staff did not have any experience with. So when she started speaking gibberish and her eyes rolled into the back of her head, they thought she was being dramatic. And when she fell over backwards she into a her. ravine, they completely ignored her. Finally, after an hour, they went to go check on her, but Erica didn't have a pulse. The staff called a medical helicopter, but they didn't- Wait, she said they didn't check on her for after an hour? Like, get you some new friends. What the heck? Your eyes start rolling in the back of your head. Oh. And they just look at you like, oh, she's all right. She's just playing. She's being dramatic. Let's let her sit there for an hour. And now she ain't have a pulse. They didn't know where they were, so they gave them the wrong coordinates. By the time Erica saw a doctor, it was five hours later, and she didn't have a chance. And programs like Erica's still exist today, trapping kids like prisoners because they're minors and can't sign themselves out. This week, I interview a survivor who was gone for three and a half years in the troubled teen industry because she was 14 years old when she was taken. This infamous 13-year-old killer was just released from prison after 28 years. On the morning of August 2nd, 1993 in Steuben County, New York, 13-year-old Eric Smith spotted a four-year-old boy named Derek Roby walking by himself. Derek was on his way to summer camp as he lived just one block away from the camp. His mother claimed that this morning was the first time she'd ever let her son walk anywhere by himself. Eric lured the young boy into the woods and violently attacked him with a rock. Mm. When Derek's mother was informed her son never made it to camp, she alerted her authorities and within hours, the four-year-old's badly beaten body was found close by in the woods. At first, authorities thought that the killer was an adult. But Eric began to act suspiciously, attracting attention from others, and soon he confessed to his mother, who turned him in. Eric was supposedly brought up with a rough home life and was diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder, a mental condition which causes unpredictable and often violent behavior. He was sentenced to nine years to life in prison, but now, as of 2022, the 42-year-old Eric Smith has been released from prison and is living life as a free years. man out on parole. Derek's parents actually say they're relieved that Eric's out on parole, as it means they don't have to attend his parole hearings and they can finally move on. Do you think young killers should be released when they're older, or do you think they should be treated like adults and spend life in prison? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Dude was a natural born killer. Nathaniel would kidnap and do terrible, terrible things to several different children. Nathaniel decided to have a little bit of a party with his friends. He invited people over and he served up burgers and sandwiches and stuff like that, and it was just a good time. Now, remember that party I told you about that he threw? Well, Nathaniel did not use regular burger meat or lunch meat for his sandwiches oh, no, and burgers. Yes. Unfortunately, the meat that was used was the flesh of these young missing children. That's just nasty. And that's just messed up, ain't it, though? Mmm. See, man, I'm gonna go vegan. I can't even do it, y'all. Can't even do it. I don't know what I'm eating, so I just might as well go vegan. For real. Thankfully, though, at his trial, Nathaniel would be convicted of aggravated assault, kidnapping, and assault. He would then be sentenced to 130 years in prison. It's an extremely dark case, and now you understand why I made this video. Did you lie, and then I realized you're just as naive as I am. You will not believe who the killer was in this child murder case. It was August in 1993 in New York when four-year-old Derek Roby was making his way to summer camp. Wait, wait, he only lived this? one block away and his mum claims that this was the first time she'd ever let him walk anywhere on his own. Tragically, that afternoon, Derek's remains were we found. Did. He was discovered in the nearby woods about halfway between his house and his intended destination. He'd been lured from the pavement, strangled and beaten with rocks. Disturbingly, he'd been SA'd with a stick. It's also worth noting that when he was found, he had Kool-Aid poured all over his body. Bizarrely, four days later, 13-year-old Eric Smith offered to so help police with the case. Though. 
When police questioned him, he initially claimed to not have seen Derek that day, but he then did keep changing his story. Now, when Eric's dad attended the police station to see what was going on, he offered Eric some Kool-Aid. Eric reacted very bizarrely to this and threw the Kool-Aid on the floor. At this point, police were very suspicious of Eric and they also found out from neighbors that he'd been asking very strange questions. These were questions all about DNA evidence and also what would happen if they found that a child had killed Derek. Shortly after, Eric did confess to the killing. He claimed that it was because of his anger about being bullied by other kids. At the age of 13, he was convicted of second degree murder. This is a more recent picture of Eric and he was actually released from prison in February of this year. This is the Hello Kitty murder. This is Fan Min Yi. Uh, Hello and Kitty on March murder. 17th, 1999, she was abducted by three men. And during her imprisonment, she was tortured and raped. She was beaten with metal bars and sometimes even strung up and used as a punching bag. The mm. men even rubbed spices onto her wounds and burned the bottom of her feet with candle wax and hot plastic so she couldn't walk. They she was forced evil. to eat human feces and urine and was subjected to horrible torture. On April 15th, 1999, fans succumbed to her wounds. Her captors weren't home, but when they got back, they dismembered her body and boiled her remains. They then sewed her skull inside this Hello Kitty doll, giving the case the name the Hello Kitty murder. She was only 23 years old, and during those months of capture, she literally went through hell. This literally. might be one of the most disturbing cases ever. This little girl was kidnapped in 2018 and has just been found. On the 25th of October 2018, four-year-old Aranza Lopez was on a supervised visit with her biological mum. Her mum, Esmeralda, was being investigated over abuse allegations, so Aranza was actually in foster care at the time. Mm. It was arranged that the pair would have a supervised visit at a Washington shopping nice centre. However, during the visit, Esmeralda requested to take Aranza to the toilets and use the opportunity to snatch the little girl in a stolen vehicle. Mm. The FBI were notified and a huge search for Aranza and even advertised a $10,000 reward. It wasn't until a year later that Esmeralda was found and arrested, but there was still no sign of the little girl. That was until last month. She was recovered by Mexican authorities in February in Western Mexico. In 2021, Esmeralda was actually extradited back to Washington state and pled guilty to second degree kidnapping and robbery. She was sentenced to 20 months in prison. This is why you should not she believe not anything that, right? you see on social media. A TikTok star named Mahek Bahari, aged just 21, has been accused of organizing a hit on her mother's lover. 46-year-old mm. Ansarine Bakari had been having an affair with 21-year-old Saki Pusan. Now, this affair had been going on for three years when Ansarine, a married woman with two children, wanted to call the affair off. The only person in her family that knew about this tryst was her 21-year-old daughter and TikTok influencer Mahek. Needless to say, this situation was messy, but it got even messier when Sahib did not take their breakup well. He simply didn't want the affair to end. Sahib then threatened that he would release compromising photos of Ansarine mm. as well as videos and messages to her husband. Absolutely terrified, Ansarine told her daughter what was happening. The pair knew that if this affair got out, their entire family would be broken. So on the 4th of January, 2022, Mahek sent her mother this text message. I'll get him jumped by some guys. He won't know what day it is. On the 11th of February, 2022, Sahib was found deceased in his car along with mm. his childhood best friend. Now, moments before that car accident, Sahib had actually made a phone call to the police. He had rang them asking for help. He said there were two cars on the road following him, trying to ram him off the road. He said he was worried for his life. Ansarine was sitting in one of those cars and shortly after midnight Sahib would crash his car off the road into a tree. Since the accident, Ansarine and Mahek have both been arrested along with six other men. It's important to note that this court case is still going through the court system and although the evidence presented so far is compelling, a verdict is yet to be reached. Hey, that's Hi, crazy. my name's Harves and I tell true crime stories. If you don't want to miss any of my content, I suggest you follow. What happened inside this house gives new meaning to the walking dead. On November 15th, 2004, this man woke up, he went to the bathroom, he did some chores, he even got locked out of his own house and had to use a spare key to get back in. And that wouldn't be strange, except that night, 
Peter Porco and his wife Joan had been attacked in their bed, and Peter had been hit in the head with an axe 16 times. Dang. Peter died that morning, but Joan lived with severe facial disfigurement, and when police started investigating, they noticed some strange things. Like, there was nothing taken from the house, there was nothing out of place, and the house's security had been turned off using the Porco's secret password. And that's because the person who was convicted of these crimes is Chris Porco. Oh, Waiting all night in the woods in Mount Vernon, Ohio, Matthew Hoffman stalked a young girl and her family. He waited until the girl and her brother came home from school, and that's when he entered the home and unalived the girl's mom, brother, and a family friend. Mm. He then kidnapped and locked her in the basement. He dismembered the bodies and hid them in an H area north of town. Thankfully, police did find the little girl locked in his basement on a bed of leaves. However, the interrogation took multiple days until Matthew admitted where the other bodies were hiding. He was sentenced <clears throat> to life in prison without warning. Viewer discretion is advised. Crazy story, In 1980, single mother Dorothy Jane Scott from California kept receiving mysterious phone calls while at work. She thought the voice sounded familiar, but she could never place it. The mystery man would call and tell her that he knew where she was every minute of the day and often threatened to her into pieces. One night, Dorothy and her friend took their co-worker to hospital after she was bitten by a spider, and once she was treated, Dorothy went to get the car to take them home. While the two women waited for Dorothy, they saw her car speed straight past them with the high beams on, leaving the pair unable to see who was driving. Dorothy was never seen alive again. After hearing nothing from their friend, they reported her missing and a few hours later, her car was found burning down a back alley. A week after Dorothy vanished, her parents received a call from an unknown man, claiming that he killed their daughter. And even though these calls continued for another for years, the police were never able to trace where they were coming well, from. In 1984, in Dorothy's were finally found, and after the media reported her death, her parents received another call from the man asking, Is Dorothy home? This unknown caller was never found. Whoa. If you get to the photo at the end of this video, Freaky. I'm sorry. In 2005, a mysterious man dubbed the Cape Intruder petrified residents of the sleepy coastal town of Cape Elizabeth, Maine, when he began breaking into their homes at night to watch them sleep. That's the creepiest thing ever. Victims describe waking up to find the Cape Intruder standing over them. But every time he ran right out of the room before anyone could catch him. He never stole anything and no one was ever hurt or touched, at least not to their knowledge. Meaning the Cape Intruder's sole purpose of the break-ins was to stand over the victims and watch them sleep. Cape Elizabeth, previously known for its postcard-worthy lighthouses, beauty, and low crime rate, was rattled and the community was living in fear. Victims worked with police to provide this chilling sketch of the suspect. People began calling police with tips of who it could be. It got to a point that everyone said he looked like someone they knew. After a few months, the Cape Intruder mysteriously stopped. Hmm. To this day, he has never been identified. Meaning, the cape intruder is still out there. The idea of someone breaking in and watching you sleep? No, no, no. That's no. crazy. A nightmare. What are your thoughts on the cape? Disturbing crimes to ever Good. take place in the state of Indiana. The employee of a fast food joint located in Speedway, Indiana, shows up only to discover something weird is going on. His co-workers are missing. All the lights mm. are on and the safe and back door are wide open. In addition to this, there were two empty currency bags as well as a roll of duct tape sitting on the table right next to the safe. Initially, the assumption was that there was not much cash inside and maybe the missing employees had just taken it for a night of party. Unfortunately, the reality was was much more terrifying and the following day they would take things a lot more seriously not only would those employees fail to show up to work but they had never even made it home the <clears> night before one of their cars was found abandoned partially unlocked on the other side of town fast forward just another 24 hours and they would finally get the call everyone had been waiting on a pair of hikers 20 miles outside of town has stumbled across this extremely gruesome crime scene there are four deceased mm -hmm. victims all of which are still in their work uniforms two of those individuals had been shot to death while another Another had been bludgeoned and the last individual had been stabbed. It was at this point investigators realized a terrible mistake had been made. That Friday, on the night of the kidnapping, they had never actually declared the restaurant an official crime scene. Therefore, it had been cleaned several times since then. And unfortunately, because of this, not another single piece of evidence would be recovered from the restaurant itself. More so, those deceased victims still had all their jewelry and or money on them, leading many to believe this was not simply a botched robbery. This would go on to become known as the Burger Chef 
murders, and although there was a very prominent suspect, no one was ever convicted of the crime. Six years later, in 1984, a man by the name of Donald Forrester comes forward saying he was part of it. He knew about things like part of a knife that broke off in one of the victims, as well as leading police to some 38 caliber shell casings which he had flushed down a toilet. They were still inside the septic tank. Later on, he would recant all of his statements, saying police coerced him into making this confession. Mm. With no direct evidence linking him to the crime itself, they were not able to pursue things any further. And as time went on, this would eventually be noted as one of the most. Dang. Yo, there's probably so many people out here that's just killers, just out here though, you know? Just walking the streets, got away with it. This is one of the most horrific manners of death I have ever heard of. Proceed with caution, this case is very graphic. Hella and Richard Kraft married in 1979 and settled down in Newtown, Connecticut, eventually having three children together. Hella was a flight attendant and Richard was an Eastern Airlines pilot who was also a volunteer constable and was a part-time police officer in Southbury. In September of 1986, Hella found out that Richard was having multiple affairs and had met with a divorce attorney. She also hired a private investigator. Mm -hmm. The private investigator had captured photos of Richard kissing another flight attendant in front of her home and this settled it. Hella was going to leave him. But on November 18th, Hella's friends had dropped her off at her and Richard's home after she got done working a long international flight. This would be the last time Hella would ever be seen again. That night, a huge snowstorm hit, and by the next morning, Richard said he was taking Hella and the kids to his sister's home in Westport, but when he arrived, Hella was not with him. Her friends knew Richard had a bad temper and grew concerned, but Richard always gave them an excuse as to why they couldn't get a hold of her. First, he said she was visiting her mom in Denmark, then said she was visiting the Canary Islands with a friend, and then said that he simply just didn't know where she was at. Hella wasn't reported missing until December 1st, and because of Richard's high status in the community, police initially didn't want to investigate him. It wasn't until December 26, when police searched Richard's home while he was away, that they found pieces of carpet that had been ripped up from the master bedroom floor. Police also found a blood smear on the side of the bed. Mm. The Crafts nanny came forward and recalled that a dark stain had appeared on that area of carpet, which was later missing. Richard's credit card reports also showed several odd purchases around the time Hella went missing, including a large freezer that was not found in the house, bed sheets, and the rental of a wood chipper and a truck. They also found the receipt for a chainsaw. A local man who was driving the town snowplow soon came forward and stated that on the night of November 18th, hours after Hella was last seen, he spotted a rental truck driven by Richard with a wood chipper attached, parked close to the shore of Lake Zor. Upon searching, investigators Richard. discovered human tissue, the crown of a tooth, a fingernail with pink nail polish, bone chips, over 2,000 pieces of blonde human hair, he and O-type blood, oh. which matched Hella's. In the lake, authorities found a chainsaw covered in blonde hair and blood, which also matched Hella's DNA. The tooth crown also positively matched to Hella's dental records. Furthermore, the serial code on the chainsaw matched to that of Richard's receipt. Authorities concluded that Richard struck Hella in the head, sitting the carpet with blood, and then kept her body in the freezer for hours until she was frozen solid, then cutting her apart with a chainsaw and feeding the pieces through the wood chipper. Richard was arrested and his first murder trial ended in a hung jury because Hella's body was never officially recovered. But after a second trial, he was found guilty and sentenced to 50 years in prison. But because of good behavior and not being a threat to the community, he was released from prison in June of last year and is now living at a halfway house in New Haven. Wow. Man, that's crazy. Threw her in a wood chipper though. Oh, oh what? Okay. Oh, I screwed in my so how do I get my car? Well, your car is totaled. That's what? Your car is totaled. Totaled? Totaled, right. Okay, so how do I get it to your screen? You don't. So, I don't go to school tomorrow, is what you're telling me? No, ma'am. Let me be honest with you. You go to jail, you don't have a bond, you kill two people tonight. I don't think you understand that. You do not have a bond. You are not getting out of jail. Your car is property of East Peoria Police Department because it's a crime scene. It killed two people tonight. You are clueless with that, clearly. I've already explained this to you. You're going to jail for reckless homicide tonight. You're going to jail for aggravated DUI for killing two people. That's what's going on. So no, you're not going to school tomorrow. you are not getting your car out of inbound. Did you just hear what I just told you? You said I'm not going tomorrow. I'm talking about Tuesday. Did you hear what I said that you... You're going to jail when we go here? Yes. Did you understand what I told that you killed two people tonight? Yes. I'm just wondering when I can go to school. She is... Cuckoo! Cuckoo! What? Oh, 
I seen this video a long time ago. Look, they went in the car and drove off. That's crazy. Scary movies you must watch. Part three. Black phone. Separation, huh? Man, I haven't seen any of these movies. Run. Oh, nope. I haven't seen this one either. Yeah, I ain't seen any of those. Slender Man case. What's this all about? Next, 41 times. Betty Gore was born on January 9th, 1950, and while she was attending college, she met a teaching assistant named Alan Gore through one of her classes. Two of them immediately hit it off, they began dating, and in 1970, Alan and Betty decided to get married. Soon after their wedding, they had their first daughter named Alyssa, and after this, they decided to move to the small town of Wiley, Texas to start a new life. Uh, at first, their marriage seemed to be great. They were very in love with each other, and they were excited to grow their family. However, according to reports, Betty did struggle with anxiety and occasional depression. Alan would often have to travel for work, so this meant that Betty was home alone with Alyssa and this would just cause her a lot of anxiety. She would constantly be calling his office to check in on him. She would call the hotel he was staying at just mm. to talk to him. The traveling was causing a lot of issues in their relationship and since they had just moved to a new town, Betty didn't really have a lot of friends. She wanted to be more active in the community so she decided to join her local church and that's when she began making friends. She started to become friends with a woman named Candace Montgomery, also known as Candy. They both sang in the choir and Candy. the reason they started to become closer is because Betty's daughter Alyssa started to grow closer to Candy. Candy's daughter. Now a little bit about Candy, she was married to a man named Pat Montgomery and the two of them lived a very comfortable life in Wiley, Texas. Her husband had a very good job so she was able to stay home and take care of their two kids. And she had a very nice house, they actually called her house the party house because that's where everyone would get together to hang out. She was friends with everyone in the community, I mean she was kind of like your typical PTA mom. But even though Betty had joined the church and had started making new friends, things between her and Alan were still not good. She even confided in her friend Candy and told her that her and Alan did not have sex. She just didn't know what else to do or or how to get the sparks going again. However, Betty ended up getting pregnant with a second daughter and she thought that this would change things between her and Alan. And it somewhat did. He was excited about their second daughter. Candy was excited about this as well. She even threw Betty a baby shower at her own house. Alan even told Betty that they were gonna take a trip to Europe, just the two of them without children so that they could reconnect and just be with each other. So it seemed like things were going well. On Friday, June 13th, 1990, Alan was away on a business trip in Minnesota and Betty was at home taking care of their newborn daughter, and getting everything ready for their trip to Europe. Their oldest daughter, Alyssa, actually spent the night at Candy's house and she was supposed to come back later that day because she had swim practice. However, Alyssa and Candy's daughter really wanted to have another sleepover, so Candy called Betty and asked her if it was okay if Alyssa spent another night there. Betty told Candy that Alyssa had swim practice and that's when Candy offered to go to Betty's house, pick up the swimsuit, and take Alyssa to practice. So hmm. Betty agreed to this plan. Later that morning, Candy stopped by Betty's house to pick up the bathing suit and then she left. As the day continued to progress, Alan called the house just to check in on Betty, but he wasn't able to get in contact with her. He called one of the neighbors to go check on Betty, and that's when they discovered that Betty was dead. Okay, more in part two. Aw, oh, don't leave us hanging like Jeffrey that. Jeffrey didn't kill himself. At least that's what a lot of people think. And here's some of the evidence that they cite when they talk about this case. So after his initial arrest, Jeffrey Epstein was placed on suicide watch for a number of reasons, even though he was continuously telling prison psychologists, friends, attorneys that he wouldn't do that and he's never considered it. So first of all, let's take a look at this sign. This is a sign that was hanging on or around Jeffrey Epstein's jail cell. No one knows why this question mark is around the mandatory. Mm. A newspaper even reached out to the Bureau of Prisons to ask about why there was an underlying question mark here, but they refused to comment. 7.49 on the night before they found Epstein dead in his cell. He's led to his cell and he's placed there. So Epstein had been on suicide watch for weeks at this point, but he had just been taken off suicide watch the day before. The people running the prison, the Bureau of Prison System, they recommended that Jeffrey Epstein needed to have a roommate at all times. Even if he had been taken off of the list, he was still on the list, if you know what I mean. Well, for some reason, that night his roommate was not assigned to him, they were removed from the cell, and that left Jeffrey Epstein completely alone in his jail cell. Now, remember this sign that said that they have to search his cell and look at Jeffrey Epstein every 30 minutes? Well, that did not happen. Well, it turns out that the two security guards that were supposed to check on him every 30 minutes, Michael Thomas and Tova Noel, did not check on him for over eight hours. 
Video surveillance footage literally shows them playing with their phones and sleeping on the job. And keep in mind that Epstein at this point was America's most high profile criminal. This dude was all over the news. And after all this, these two were charged with falsifying documents and attempting to defraud the federal mm -hmm. government. So Dang, something that's you know always about kind that. of rubbed me the wrong way about all this is the security camera footage itself. Now, this is a prison. Every angle should have been being captured at every single moment. You know, anything can happen in prison. And video footage of the security guards exists from that night, but there is no video footage of Epstein's cell block area or his cell door. It's actually been reported that the camera that was shooting the angle down Jeffrey Epstein's cell block area corrupted the night that he took his own life. Of all times for this one specific camera to corrupt what? and the footage to be lost, it was corrupted. that night when it happened. And there's a lot more that we're going to get into, but like I said, there's just a lot here that we're going to cover, but this quote really says a lot about what I just told you. So Epstein's taken off suicide watch the day before he kills himself. His roommate is removed from the cell. The cameras on his tier are not working. The guards fell asleep. It seems almost impossible to think all those things could happen in that way. And this is Epstein we're talking about, America's most high profile prisoner. In fact, the suicide watch observation log, this is the actual document, shows that Epstein was acting pretty normally that day. Which isn't to say that he wasn't deceiving people by saying he didn't want to take his own life when he was secretly trying to get alone time where he could do it, but, but it's still an interesting side note. In the next TikTok, we're going to get into the really crazy stuff. Yo, that this story keeps me up at night, and it's a real one. So in the early 90s, a woman named Jerry went to a psychotherapist named John Mack that? because she was having recurring nightmares of UFOs. Then one night, her two-year-old son started screaming in terror in his room. She ran in to check on him, and he claimed that owl monsters were touching his legs. And when she asked where the owl monsters were now, he claimed that they were in a boat in the sky. So Jerry starts thinking that maybe her family is being visited by aliens. She kind of brushed it off at first, but then one night her daughter has this experience. She was practicing reading for school and she had to time herself in 10 minute intervals and see how far she could read. So she's timing herself for 10 minutes, marking how far she read, timing herself for 10 minutes, marking, timing herself for 10 minutes, and then she looks up and an hour has gone by. There's 50 minutes of time she can't account for, which apparently is kind of common in people who have been visited by aliens. Mm. We talk more about this story and other alien encounters on my podcast this week. And we hear a story from someone whose grandfather was visited by aliens in the 60s. I mean, that's pretty interesting, you know. Whatever you do, do not feel sorry for this woman. This woman's name is Yoslin Ortega, and she was a nanny. She had been working for her current employer for two years, and she was not very happy. So she planned something that most of us can't even imagine. She was babysitting these two kids aged two and six, and because she was so angry at their mother, she ended both their lives. And after she did, she put both their lifeless bodies into a bathtub and waited for the mother to come back home. And of course, when she did, the mother was absolutely floored and shocked as to what had happened. The nanny tried to kill herself by stabbing herself in the neck. You can actually see the wound right Right there yeah. but she survived her injuries during court she said the reason she did what she did is because she wanted to see the mother's reaction to her slain kids the mother marina Krim, had very little to say on that day because obviously she was so upset and the nanny was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole what all because you just want to see the reaction though since we're all talking about Some the World people. Cup, let's talk about how this soccer player was murdered after he lost the game. On June 22, 1994, Andres Escobar, who was the captain of Colombia's soccer team, was playing against the U.S. and scored in his own net during the World Cup. Colombia ended up losing the game 2-1 to one and was eliminated. Ten days later, Andres was confronted by a group of men outside a club in the city of Medellin. These men began harassing Andres and making fun of him for shooting in his own net and even though he tried to reason with them, they shot him six times. The next day, police arrested Umberto Castro Munoz, who was associated with powerful criminals and drug traffickers. It's been said that the criminals that Umberto was working with were betting a lot of money on Colombia to win, and when they lost because of Andres' mistake, then they ordered Umberto to murder him. Umberto was sentenced to 43 years in prison, but only served 11 years before being released for good behavior. More than 120,000 people attended Andres' funeral role and Colombia created a statue of him in 2002. Dang, that's crazy, man. You gotta watch out with them sports bets, Born especially like FanDuel. Crack cocaine. Little Elisa Izquierdo didn't stand a chance with a mother like hers.
Elisa was born in 1989 in Brooklyn, New York to parents Ewilda Lopez and Gustavo Izquierdo. Throughout her pregnancy with Elisa, Ewilda was abusing crack cocaine, meaning when Elisa was born, she actually had to be weaned off the drugs as she was addicted. Mm. She's a crack Gustavo baby. Gustavo ended his relationship with Ewilda when he realised what she was doing and he vowed to get custody of Elisa. She actually had two children from a previous relationship that she'd lost custody of due to her drug abuse and they were being raised by family members. When Elisa was born, Gustavo actually managed to win custody and his world revolved around his daughter. He started taking parenting classes and he enrolled Elisa in a preschool in 1990. Unfortunately, his health started to decline and he could no longer afford the tuition fees, but she was a promising student and the principal of the school decided to introduce her to one of the patrons of the school. This was Prince Michael of Greece and he actually offered to pay for Elisa's tuition fees right up until 12th grade. During yeah. her first year of preschool, it came to Gustavo's attention that Awilda had actually beaten her addiction, secured permanent accommodation, got married and become pregnant with her fourth child. She'd also regained custody of her two older children. When Elisa was just two, Awilda applied for visitation rights and she won, meaning that Elisa would go and stay with her unsupervised every other weekend. Shortly after these visits started, Gustavo and also teachers at Elisa's school started to notice bruises. She also <laughs> began bedwetting and started having regular nightmares. She also told her father at one point that her mother had beaten her and locked her in a closet. Gustavo tried to get Wilder's visitation rights revoked, but it was denied, saying that as long as she didn't beat her daughter, the visitation could continue. In 1993, Gustavo decided to come up with a plan to get Elisa away from her mother permanently. He was from Cuba and still had family there, so he decided to buy tickets for him and Elisa and take her where her mother couldn't hurt her anymore. The tickets were booked for May 26, 1994, but shortly before that, Gustavo started to experience breathing difficulties. He was admitted to hospital and diagnosed with lung cancer. Ooh. He then sadly died on the exact day he planned to take Elisa to Cuba. Ain't that on some? hearing about Gustavo's death, Awilda decided to apply for full custody of her daughter. Due to the previous abuse of Elisa, there were multiple objections to the court from Gustavo's family and also Prince Michael of Greece. Despite that, Awilda was awarded full custody of Elisa. Mm. On TikTok, you suppress the video, I don't even care no more. So, Aubrey, the woman that was the cause of the Nashville school shooting, <clears throat> people are defending uh -oh. her because they don't like that people are using the wrong pronouns to identify them. Basically, Audrey was a woman transitioning to become a man. Because of this, some people are calling Audrey a woman, even though Audrey identified as a man now. So the community is upset at this, stating that no matter what heinous crime Audrey did, there's no reason to be calling them the wrong pronoun. I wish I could be making this up, but I promise you, any video you see reporting mm -hmm. this, That's they crazy. are saying this. Imagine defending a child murderer. You get no respect when you go on an active hunt to murder innocent children and people because you did not like a Christian school. Anybody defending this woman needs to be put in jail. Yeah, that is crazy though, right? Like, it's another know, rainy man. day in the South. I ain't gonna speak on it. Sunshine today. This woman is a prime example of how easily you can deceive people on your social media. This is Farron Jill Hudson, 35 years old from Alabama. And the story starts in 2021 when her husband was arrested on five counts of possessing obscene material with a child under the age of 17. Later that year, he was rearrested for 76 counts of possession of child corn. Now, at the time, he claimed the police had planted these images on his phone, these videos, and there was an investigation undertaken. But when police investigated James's phone, they found evidence that linked his wife, Jill, to these crimes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jill, the happy-go-lucky TikToker talking what? about God and sunshine. So after this new evidence came to light, new charges were added and Jill was arrested. And these new charges included incest, essay of a child, and production of obscene materials with a child under the age of 17. So during her interrogation, after she was arrested, Jill was shown a still image from one of these child corn videos that she allegedly helped to produce. And she confirmed to detectives and investigators that indeed it was her and another child in that video. Apparently, Jill confirmed that it was her in the video performing an obscene act with a child. 
But after she was arrested, Jill was stupid enough to call a family member and on the phone call from jail, she asked her family member to go check her devices and destroy evidence. Uh, so obviously stupid. authorities were listening into that phone call. They were able to get search warrants for all of her other electronics and they're undergoing a search of her property right now. It's just wild. You wouldn't imagine that that woman who posted that video would be accused of doing such horrific things with children. And it just goes to show that these predators are everywhere. So we have to stay vigilant and keep our children safe. That should be our number one priority in this nation. That's true, man. These kids got too much freedom. They be on these phones, on TikTok, Four, three, on, on all these apps. A 14 -year -old no Beth control. She was killed after getting into a fight with her school bully. So yeah, according to this friend, what? even after her death, Norma continued to get bullied and taunted. The fact that classmates showed up to her funeral to make fun of her is wild. As for Asada, the one funeral? who killed Norma, she showed absolutely no sign of remorse. She never called the family to offer her condolences. She never took accountability for anything. In fact, after Norma died, she wasn't immediately arrested. It wasn't until the case started to go viral on social media that the investigators finally took the case seriously, fired the director of the school, and they immediately began searching for Asada. And on March 18th, 2023, Asada was finally arrested. Now, since she is only 14 years old, she was sent to this correctional facility in Mexico that's specifically for minors. The place is called the Quinta del Bosque Correctional Facility, and at this facility, you go to workshops, you go to classes, you go to therapy, you basically do activities to try to become a better person. The maximum sentence that you can have at this facility is five years. Unfair that Asada took someone's life. She literally killed Norma. She hit her on the head with the rock and all she might get is just five years at a correctional facility. A facility where you go to therapy and you go to workshops and you do like group activities. It just doesn't seem fair right. to a lot of people. If she felt grown enough to taunt Norma, to bully her, to assault her, and to fight her, then she should be grown enough to be charged as an adult. The fact that she was acting all cocky and proud in front of Alma and told her, yeah, I beat up your sister, yeah, I broke her nose, just shows the kind of person that Asada truly is. She showed absolutely no remorse and the family feels that this is not justice. The family is happy that the director of the school was fired, but they also feel like the professors and the other classmates need to face some consequences. The professors knew about the bullying, but they didn't do anything to protect Norma. The family also feels like all the classmates that stood there and watched this happen should be held accountable. They should either get suspended or be expelled from school because they took part in the bullying. It's so heartbreaking that Norma tried to get help, but she didn't receive it. It's really sad that the last few months of her life, she was filled with so much sadness, with so much heartbreak, and with so much disappointment. She did not deserve this and we need to do better. Something needs to change and I hope that everyone that needs to be held accountable for Norma's death is held accountable. My thoughts and prayers go out to her family. I am so sorry that this happened to her and it's just so heartbreaking because she was just a couple of weeks away from her 15th birthday. Her birthday is on April 25th and she was so excited to be turning 15 years old. It's just so unfortunate that she never got to make it and that her life was taken from her. I hope that Norma truly gets justice. Straight up, yo, that's messed up, man. Like, hey, school is scary, right? You send your kids to school, you don't know what's going to happen, right? You know, she got into a fight. She didn't beat this girl to death. And then her sentence was basically a five-year after-school program. You know, go have some fun for five years. We're going to lock you over here. And then we're going to let you back up. See if you do it again. But, man, feel sorry for her family, for real. Teenager's reaction to getting a life sentence. that there is only one appropriate sentence in this case. Mr. Fucci, if you and your attorneys will please rise. Counsel, is there any legal reason why this court cannot impose sentence at this time? Mr. Fucci, having entered a plea of guilty to the crime of first-degree murder, I adjudicate you guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey. I sentence you to life in prison. Because of your age, you are eligible for a review of the sentence in 25 years. He was okay with it. Wait a minute, what was that? Imagine growing up knowing that you were adopted and 60 years later when you take an ancestry DNA test, you find out that your birth mom was the victim of one of the most notorious cold cases in American history. Mm. Richard Hanchett was born in 1958 in Michigan and he was immediately given up for adoption by his birth mother. In 2018, Richard, who still lived in Texas, decided to take an ancestry DNA test and he was immediately matched with relatives from his birth mother's family. He connected with them and even went down to Tennessee to finally meet them. 
And that's when Richard learned that his birth mother, Ruth Marie Terry, had been missing since the early 70s. For decades, her family searched for her, but they were unable to find her until 2022. In October of this year, the FBI and Massachusetts State Police announced that nearly 50 years later, they had finally identified the victim of the oldest unsolved homicide case in Massachusetts, the Lady of the Dunes. And the Lady of the Dunes was identified as Ruth Marie Terry. On July 26, 1974, a little girl was hiking with her family when she came across the body of a mutilated woman. Her hands were missing. Police believe this was an attempt to get rid of her fingerprints so they couldn't identify her, and her head was nearly severed. Mm. Detectives searched motels and rooming houses and even reviewed thousands of missing persons cases from Massachusetts. They also used clay models to recreate what the Lady of the Dunes might have looked like. Her case unfortunately went cold, and some even speculated that she was the victim of the South Boston gangster Whitey Bulger. In 2000, authorities had her body exhumed to extract DNA, but it wasn't until recently that they were able to use genealogy testing to identify her. This is the same technique that was used to identify the Golden State Killer. Now flash forward to November of this year, authorities announced that they had a new development in the investigation. They had now identified the Lady of the Dunes, now they had to identify who her killer was. Authorities revealed they were seeking information on a man who was already deceased. This man was known as Guy Rockwell Moldavin. Hmm. Guy was an antique dealer and he was actually arrested in 1960 in connection to the disappearance of his former wife and her daughter. Uh, Remains believed to be theirs were found in their Seattle home. He only served a suspended sentence so he actually got released in 1962. Now, court records indicate that Guy and Ruth actually got married in Reno, Nevada in February of 1974, just months before she was killed. Now that they have her identity, this case is being treated as a homicide investigation by the Massachusetts State Police and FBI. The public is actually being asked to review Terry's Seeking Information poster. Um, This includes newly released photos and a little bit more information. This case is still ongoing. Dark web footage that got leaked. Luz Gonzalez and how she was killed while her mom tied her shoes. The family is originally from Mexico, but at the time, Luz lived in Brooklyn, New York with her mother, Reina. And she was just honestly the cutest little four-year-old girl. She was just absolutely adorable and just so nice and kind to everyone. On Sunday, June 24th, 2018, Luz and her mother were walking outside of this laundromat called the Clean City Laundromat in New York. They were walking along the sidewalk, but as you can see, this whole parking lot is just a mess. There is no division between the parking lot and the sidewalk, so if someone reverses from the laundromat, they literally have to drive over the sidewalk. It was just not a safe sidewalk, and Luz was riding her scooter up and down the sidewalk, having fun with her mother following closely behind. Now, as she's riding her scooter, her shoe actually falls off, so Luz gets off the scooter and she goes over to pick up her shoe. Luz tried to put the shoe on herself, but she was four years old at this time, so she was struggling to do so, and that's when her mother, Reina, decided to bend down and help her daughter. So Reina bent down to tie her daughter's shoe, and as you can see, they're still on the sidewalk. They're not in the parking lot, they're not in the middle of the road, like they're literally on the sidewalk, which is meant for pedestrians. But again, this parking lot and this sidewalk were built incorrectly, so in order for someone to back out or get inside the laundromat, they literally have to drive over the sidewalk. So as you can see, Luz and her mother are crouched down on the ground trying to put on her shoe when all of a sudden, 38-year-old Jeanette Maria, who is driving this black SUV, starts to back out of the parking lot. Again, Luz and her mother are low on the ground. It's not like Reina is standing up and is super obvious, but at the same time, when you're backing out, you should always be aware of your surroundings. So Jeanette backs out of the parking lot, and as you can see, Luz and her mother were right in front of her. As she gets ready to peel out of the parking lot, she runs over four-year-old Luz and her mother Reina. After she ran them over, Jeanette stopped because she obviously realized that she had hit something. So she stopped the car, she took a little bit of a pause, and then she just continued driving. She just drove off and she left Luz and Reina 
what? the sidewalk. She didn't call she the didn't police. Hit the she girl. didn't get out of her car to check, you know, what she had hit. Nothing. Which is just crazy because her car literally shook after running over two people. She obviously was aware that she had hit something, but she didn't care enough to get out and look at what had happened. Now, people saw all of this go down, so they immediately ran over to loosen her mother and tried to call for help. Mm -hmm. There's actually video footage of Reina just sitting on the ground, hugging her daughter, and she just looks like she's in shock. Reina had a really bad injury to her leg, but the injuries to her daughter Luz were much more severe. Police were informed about what had happened, and they actually pulled over the driver, Jeanette Maria, about four blocks away from the laundromat. Police informed her that she had just ran over a four-year-old girl and her mother, and Jeanette was in complete shock. She said she had no idea how this had happened, and that she had no idea she had hit someone. She denies everything, what? and then the police just let her go. Okay, I'm running out of time. More in part what? two. What? They just let her go? I didn't do anything. I didn't hit nothing. I am Nanny Doss. I was mm. known as the giggling granny because I seemed harmless and sweet. But the truth is, I was a serial killer. It is creepy. Hold I was on. responsible for the deaths of four of my husbands, two of my children, my mother, my sister, and my two grandsons. I used various methods to kill them, such as poisoning them with arsenic, rat poison, or sometimes even boiling water. Mm -hmm. My first husband, Charlie Braggs, died after just a few months of marriage. I poisoned him with rat poison, as I had grown tired of his abusive behavior. I then went on to marry and kill three more husbands, Robert Harrelson, Richard L. Morton, and Samuel Doss. With each of these men, I used a different method of poisoning. In addition to my husbands, I also killed my two middle daughters, Melvina and Florine. I gave them a concoction of rat poison and crushed glass, claiming it was medicine to make them feel better. Crushed glass. They died in agony. I also killed my mother, Louisa, with arsenic, and my sister, Dovey, with rat poison. My crimes were finally uncovered after the suspicious death of my fifth husband, Samuel Doss. A doctor who had attended to one of my previous victims reported me to the authorities, and I was arrested in 1954. I confessed to all of my crimes and was sentenced to life in prison. Yo, that was some creepy AI stuff. Like, I felt like I was really looking at this person. Those are some scary, true, and sad crime TikToks, man. I ain't gonna lie, man. Some of those things is kind of sad. Yeah, if you guys like the content, don't forget to subscribe, turn your notification bell on, and until next time, YouTube, peace.